The field of physics speaks of two forces that form a pair, centripetal and centrifugal forces. You know these? We're not in a physics class, so we're not going into any detail. But simply put, when something spins around, we call that force that presses toward the center centripetal. And we call the felt force pressing outward centrifugal. Inward, outward. They're really two sides of the same force. So if you tie a string to a ball and you spin it around your head like this, the string is supplying a centripetal force to keep the ball near you. Otherwise, it just flies away. It's pulling toward you at the center. If you take your car and you go on one of these roundabouts out here fairly quickly, you will feel your body shifting in which direction? Toward the outside of the circle. That is a centrifugal outward force. It doesn't really matter that you understand the physical unless you're an engineer or something, but for the rest of us, it matters in the sense that this is true in the physical realm. There's something very similar to these forces to be found in the spiritual realm, and these matter quite a lot. You can put it this way. Human nature, what you are naturally from the time you are born, is centripetal. You always pull inward toward yourself. Ever since the fall, ever since Eve ate the fateful fruit, that's what we do. We become like the sun of our own universe and everything circles around us. Or maybe the better analogy is a black hole and we suck things toward ourselves. We are the point of reference and everything serves us. We are a lot like Lamech. If you remember him in Genesis chapter 4, so early in the Bible, he was that man in a fallen world who spoke to his two wives, Ada and Zillah. Not only did he have two wives contradicting God's intention for marriage, he was selfish in that way, but he said to them, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. Already in Genesis 4, Lamech has set himself up as the center of the universe. His wives, he even calls them, you wives of Lamech. <laughs> Don't call your wife, you wife of your own name. Everything for him centered around himself. It's a picture of where humanity was and where it was going, a centripetal force, if you will. That's all of us by nature. And then Christ comes into the picture. And what happens? He snips the string, and out we go. He comes in as a sort of centrifugal force. He changes not just one or two small things about you, not just the way you talk, you stop cussing or something like that. What Jesus does when he comes into your life is he changes the force being exerted within your life. You go from sucking everything in for your own pleasure and good and use to a centrifugal force that is now focused outward. There's still selfishness, but there is a general force pushing outward. It's because Jesus says things like, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You still have a self, but now your whole life is going outward from the self toward other selves and toward God. I'm not talking about some aspect of personality. It's not that if you become a Christian, you become extroverted and you go and talk to everyone all the time. You maintain mostly your personality. This isn't a question of that. It is the orientation of your thinking, of your actions, of your lifestyle, how you use your money, how you plan for the future. It's everything about your life. It now has an orientation outward. Of course, when Christ sets you free, the first outward looking that you do is toward Christ himself. Your strained, weary eyes that have been staring at yourself very intently in a miserable fashion now finally look up and the first thing you see is the hand of the man touching you to clear your leprosy. The first person you see is Christ himself. He opens your eyes with spittle. Now you see him. And of course, seeing him, you see his father, for he reveals the father to you and reconciles you to the father. You're looking outward, outward to the father. The spirit of God dwells within you. You're focused on the spirit. You're focused on God as Trinity. However, 
it is not possible for you to look out toward God and have a life pushing outward like that without seeing all the people in the middle here before you see God. All of the believers in this room, your brothers and your sisters, you see them too. You didn't before because you were focused on you. You were using them as pawn pieces. But when Christ changes your life, now outward you realize, oh, they have lives too. They have needs too. If this is true, that trusting in Christ is a refashioning of what force is driving you, then you can tell what John is going to say in this passage already. It's not possible for you to really be outwardly focused on God if you're not also, as a way of life, outwardly focused on believers. You can't be here and here, only one. And to be a Christian is to have a realized, centrifugal, outward force at work in your life. We're going to see that as we come now to the end of John chapter, 1 John chapter 4. If you remember, we're in the, one of the longest sections on love in John, and we're concluding it in chapter 4 here except that it sort of continues into chapter 5. Therefore, we'll cover the first two verses of that. So read with me. We're in 1 John 4, and I'm starting in verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments. There are some knots to untie, especially in chapter 5. But the apostle's whole point in this passage is simply this. If you love God, you will love the people in this room. You will love believers, what he calls a brother or a sister. We're going to see next week how faith and obedience fit in. He hints at it at the end of verse 2, obeying God's commandments, and that transitions us into what we'll see next week. But right now, the focus is still on love, love for God, love for others. And what he's going to say here is a Christian is not someone who simply says, I love God, or pick any phrase of that sort. It's not simply someone who says, I am a Christian. I am a believer. That's easy. Talk is cheap. And John is quite willing to call someone a liar. If they say, my life is outward toward God, I love Him. But when it comes to believers, I'm inward toward myself. He says, you can't be both. You're either outward or you're inward. You either love God and believers or you love yourself. There's no middle ground. Those are the only two choices. So to consider this passage today, what we're going to do is look at the negative, positive aspects that are in this passage because in the first verse, he starts rather negatively. He's calling someone a liar. So we will look at that. His point there is when it comes to love, talk is cheap. It means nothing. But then he turns in the rest of the passage in a very positive direction and says that Christian love is a rich love. So you have here cheap talk and rich love. If you need an outline, those will be the two headings. So let's begin in our passage with cheap talk. As it's given in verse 20, it reads, If anyone says, there's the talk, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, 
he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we just step back for one second, the first observation that's clear here is not everyone who says they're a Christian is genuinely a Christian. That's obvious in this verse. He's calling someone claiming to love God a liar. There is such a way to live your life where the claim is from your mouth, your talk, I love God, I am a Christian, but he says your life doesn't reflect that, therefore the reality is that you're not. When you say I'm a Christian, you're lying. That's what he's saying in the passage. You can see it there. Last week I made a, a, a mistake and someone pointed this out to me, so thank you. I mentioned the second great awakening Last week, I was talking about the first Great Awakening of the 1700s, but I thought this week, I do want to talk about the second Great Awakening, which took place in the early 1800s because it ties into the observation we're making here of false Christians. In the early 1800s, God did a work, a second Great Awakening, if you will, of many people professing Christ, and there were real conversions that took place, but it was not like the first Great Awakening of the 1700s. During the First Great Awakening, here in America and in England and in other parts of the world, there were so many people who came to Christ, and those who were human leaders of the movement were acknowledging this is a work none of us brought about. It is entirely an act of God. The primary human leader of the Second Great Awakening was a man named Charles Finney. And we are grateful for ways that God used Finney, but there's no way to avoid the fact that Finney stated very clearly, revivals are not things that just come from God. Revivals are something that we can manufacture. He wrote a book to argue it. He said, we can make revivals happen. And if you understand that position of Finney, you understand a lot of American evangelical Christianity up to the present. That really helps you understand it. Finney's position was that if you can get someone, even emotionally, to the place where their will inclines to accept Jesus, a single moment of making that decision to receive Jesus Christ, if you can, by whatever means, pushing, polling, playing the music, do whatever you have to do, if you get them in a weak moment to confess Jesus Christ, then they are saved forever. And therefore, Finney's ministry was very sentimental. It was high on emotion. It was focused on making a decision. He didn't have altar calls, which came shortly afterward, but he had an anxiety bench that was a very similar thing. Just whatever it takes to follow the procedure to manufacture a revival, basically taking the place of the Holy Spirit. Now, why do we talk about this today? Well, the re sad result one of the sad results of that mindset is that in America today, you have thousands and thousands of people who sincerely believe that they are true Christians. And you would say, why? And they would say, oh, I love God. You see that in our text? They would say, um, when I was young, I made a decision to trust in Jesus. And therefore, I'm a believer. And you look at the life, there's no change. They may hate their brother. But because of Finney's emphasis, and it's not just him, but that led into things, because of the emphasis of that singular decision with a heightened emotion, even if it doesn't change your life, then today there are many, many people relying on for their eternal security, depending upon an experience they had at a youth camp as a child or in a church. Which again, those can be legitimate. Someone can come to Christ, but also someone may not come to Christ. Say, how can you say that? That's very judgmental. I didn't even call him a liar yet. That's what John does in our text. He says, you find someone who says, I love God, but what's the problem? They're saying that, but it's in their life there's a problem. And the one he pinpoints here is they hate believers. And not even in John's mind, I'm sure every believer, but... Even specific believers hate them, do not tolerate them, vicious, cruel toward them, but I love God. And John says, no. It doesn't matter what a preacher told you, and it doesn't matter what you received at a youth camp, because if you say, I love God, and you trusted in Christ truly at some point, there will be a change in your life. 
Because when you trust in Christ, it's not like nothing happens but words. It's not cheap talk. Something really takes place. It's invisible, spiritual, but it really takes place within your heart, and it produces not perfection, but it produces a marked change. What kind of change are we talking about? A movement from a centripetal life that's entirely about you to a change outward toward God and toward believers and unbelievers as well in love. It's just another way of saying love becomes a characteristic of your life. John's been arguing that throughout this entire letter. I probably don't have to give it to you of that. Now, someone who says, I love God, this may be someone in John's mind who is sincere even in stating that. They probably are not just lying about it. It could be. But they may be like I was growing up where I didn't know Christ, but I thought I did. So if you ask me, I would say, of course I love God. If you remember in 1 John chapter 1, John spoke of those people who said they have no sin, and he said they deceive themselves. Not only are they liars who deceive others, but they're even lying to themselves. So this person who says, I love God, but is a liar, they might not even be aware that they are lying. It's not just religious hypocrites who are aware of their hypocrisy, but anyone whose life has not been altered or changed. The point John is making here, I hope you see, is just that talk by itself is cheap. It's, it's cheap. It does nothing. I could say right now, fervently, that all of the planets gravitationally rotate around Pluto. I just said that. Is that true? No. It's not true whatsoever. They're still spinning around the sun like they've always done. That's the reality. I could say anything I want of myself. I could say anything I want of yourself, but the words don't have power to change reality. We've spoken of this before. And John is making that point. I could say that I have three eyes, but behold, I have two eyes. It doesn't change the reality of things. I'm not denying that there is a sort of power to words. The power is one of persuasion. Even in the gospel, Romans chapter 1, the words we speak of the gospel are powerful unto salvation. So there's a power when God uses our words, certainly. But when we're speaking words that don't correspond to what is real, when someone says, I love God, but it's not really true, and there's evidence of that in their life, then John's answer to that is not to coddle your feelings and make you feel better. His answer to that is simply in this passage, you are a liar. I can say I love God all day and night, but if my heart hasn't been changed, not perfectly, but characteristically from an inward to an outward life, if I love God only in the sense that He's welcome to be one of the many planets that orbit around me in my solar system, then you don't love God. That's John's point. That's why he brings this proof as the point upon which our love for God stands or falls quote, and hates his brother. Again, the focus here is inward, when you trust in Christ, you become outward. You are either a centripetal or a centrifugal person. In fact, the point he makes in our text, which is interesting, is that loving people, loving the believers who are around you, hard as that may be, is not as hard as loving God. And if you can't do what's easier, then you're not doing what's harder. And the way he puts it in our text is that you've never even seen God. So you have to live a loving relationship with a being. You've dedicated your entire life to him. You love him. You're passionate about him. You spend every day thinking about him. That's the goal. That's what you're striving for. But you've never seen him. And John says, look at the believers in this room. You see him all the time. You feel like you see them too much sometimes. And he's saying, if you can't love these people you see, where you can actually talk to them, you can actually meet their needs, you can actually do things for them, you can actually spend time with them, you can write them a letter, you can call them, you can talk to them, you can serve them, you can do their yard. There's physical, tangible things you can do for them because you see them. If you can't do that, if you aren't doing that, then you don't love God. The reality is that we would think it's the opposite. 
We would think it's easier to love God because we don't see Him, but actually it's just easier to pretend that we love God because we don't see Him. It's fairly difficult for me to go on hating someone publicly without it being known. You'll see the grimaces, you'll see the discomfort. It's hard to hide that, but it's really easy to hide if I don't love God. Because I can pretend to love Him. He doesn't show up, you don't see my response to Him on my face. It's easy to pretend we love God, but John is saying to actually love God is harder than to love believers. And if you're living an outward life, no matter how weak or strong, but that's the orientation of your life, your love is going to reach believers and then reach God in terms of difficulty. So if you're not even here, if you don't love believers, he's saying you don't love God. It's an argument. If you can't do the lesser, you can't do the greater. You see that in the text. The point of verse 20 is negative. If you don't love the believers around you, then you don't love God. It's cheap talk. He just calls it out very plainly. You can say whatever you want to say. The talk doesn't do anything. It's good to confess Christ. Don't mistake me. We should say we love God. And I say it often. You should say it often because we do love God. But say it if it's real. Say it if it's true. The talk itself proves nothing. So that's verse 20. Very negative. But he says it very plainly. Talk is cheap. But the majority of our passage is actually rather positive. And as we move into 21 and into chapter 5, we're moving from a warning about cheap talk and we're moving into what's offered to us instead. In Christ, we can live with a Christian love and a Christian love is not cheap talk. A Christian love is a rich love. Here's verse 21, and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. John may mean that this commandment comes from God the Father. See that this commandment we have from him, but he doesn't say who him is. The him could be referring to God the Father, and that would be true. Even in the Old Testament, this was a command given to us that Jesus quotes, love God, love your neighbor. Or on the other hand, he may mean by him Jesus Christ, because even as we sang, this is the commandment that we love one another. This is Jesus' commandment that we love one another. John 13, a new commandment I give to you, Jesus said to his followers, that you love one another. So it could be from him commandment from the Father or from the Son. I tend to think it's from the Father just because he's in the context of this passage. But observe how in either case, it is called a commandment. And we're talking about love, but he calls it a commandment. If it is a commandment given to us to love, then we should not misunderstand. It is not automatic. Because what we just talked about if Christ changes your heart, you will love believers. That is true. Does that get you off the hook because now you don't have to do anything? It's just natural. It's automatic. If you really know Christ, it will just happen. No. <laughs> it will happen, but not apart from your effort. Rich Christian love always requires our effort. That's why this is His commandment. It is a commandment that comes from Him that we love one another. It's a commandment. That phrase there, must also love, has love in what we call a subjunctive mood. When we use an indicative mood, which we mostly do, we're talking about something that's just a reality. So, if this was in the indicative, he would say, whoever loves God loves his brother. And there is truth to that. But notice that's not what he says. He wants to place the emphasis elsewhere. He uses a subjunctive. And so, it comes out, whoever loves God must, must also love his brother. It's meant as a command because it's a commandment. It's something you have to do. It's not just something that happens without you doing it. It requires an effort. So the question here is, if this rich Christian love requires an effort of us, if it's a commandment that's been given to us that we must do this, 
How much effort are you putting into loving the believers around you? Maybe it seems like I keep hitting the same nail with a hammer, but that's because John keeps doing it. We have to love one another. It's not even optional. It's just given as a command. And you're aware that if you think it's automatic, if you do not put any effort into loving other people, it's like putting your car in neutral, but you're always on a slope because of our fallen nature. It's not like you just stay at a normal relationship with other people. If you are not putting in the effort to move up the hill, then you will be rolling down the hill. Your relationships will all deteriorate without effort, just like your house. If you don't put effort into upkeeping it, it doesn't just stay how it is right now. It starts to deteriorate very quickly. It's the same with your loving relationships with the other believers who are in this room. It's not any different than that. You know that when you first come to a local church or you first join a small group or a Bible study or you first encounter a group of believers, if you have an affinity or a connection there, if there's a spark, then at first, loving believers feels very easy. It almost is like it just happens by itself. But that is kind of like the infatuation part of a romantic relationship. You say, it just is so easy to talk to this person. And I just love to be with this person. That's good. It is not going to stay that way. If you've been married more than a month, you know that this is true. That is something God's designed in us as sort of infatuation, even on a biological level that's meant to push you to get married. <laughs> so do that. That's good. But that infatuation, that high heart race, when you see the person, it can't last forever if for no other reason you die at a young age. And so the infatuation has a purpose, but the infatuation is not itself what love is. It gets you to the place where you commit in to that relationship and then love deepens. A couple that's been married for 20 years, they're not going to have that same level of infatuation they had when they were dating, but is their love greater or less than that couple? Their love is a greater, a deeper, a matured love. But oh, how much effort it took over 20 years. <laughs> how much effort required every day. Infatuation seems to require no effort whatsoever. And it'd be great if life just went on that way. But if you're in a marriage, for it to succeed, there has to be grueling sometimes, ongoing effort to fight your pride and sin, to love your spouse, to be creative. You have to put effort into it. And when you bring that over to your love for believers, it's much the same. You may have an infatuation when you first come to, say, Faith Bible Church or any church. You first come in, you see the love people have for each other, you hear the word, you love the worship, and you're amazed, and you're encouraged, and you're growing. It's not gonna stay that way forever <laughs> and it's not a faith bible thing it's an every church thing it's the way god designed it hopefully you do feel that joy and that zeal that's meant to plug you in this is a little different but become a member okay can i say that become a member it's not the same as marriage but it's similarly making a commitment to this local group of believers or wherever you are you commit in and then the infatuation starts to die down and you may interpret that as, I'm no longer in love with this church. <laughs> or no longer in love with these people. I need to find somewhere else. And there's certainly a time to find somewhere else. This is not locking the doors. However, I do want to remind you on the basis even of this passage that you're loving other believers here. It's a commandment. It's something you must do, meaning it will require effort on your part to do it. It will not happen by itself. It must happen if you're a believer, so it will happen, but it will not happen apart from your effort. Sometimes it is a lot of effort that you have to put in. You will be disappointed by believers, and then you have to deal with that. You will be offended, and you will offend someone else. You will be struggling, and no one will reach out to you. They'll forget. You'll be offended by what someone says or does. Or you'll just start to feel uncomfortable around certain people because of who knows what. And the feeling at that point may be, run! <laughs> run as fast as you can! It's unpleasant! Get out of there! Listen, it is a commandment 
not that they love you. It is a commandment that you love them, and it will not happen without your effort. That means it's going to be hard sometimes. It's simply an encouragement not to jump from group to group to group of believers when you get jaded with one group. It's fine for relationships to change. It's fine even for churches to change. Move to another church. It's not in itself sin. That's not what I'm saying. But there should be an inertia about you in a, any group of believers you're with where you are committed to putting in the effort to love others. If there's false teaching, get out of there. <laughs> But if we're just talking about run-of-the-mill tensions and struggles that happen, there should be an inertia keeping you there so that you're loving others. So first, rich love as a Christian, verse 21, it requires our effort. It is a commandment. Now, if it's coming from our effort, where is our love going to? And that is the next point John makes now in chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. The idea here is this. Do you love God? After reading verse 20, maybe you're hesitant. <laughs> but do you really love God? If you really love God as your Father then you need to realize you're not the only child he has. There are many who have been born of him. And if you love the father in a functional family, which I realize we don't all have, but in a functional family, there is a love among siblings. We at least acknowledge that's how a family should be. And that's the point that he's making here. If that's true of an earthly family, how much more in the spiritual? You can't say you love the father of this family, God, but man, you hate everyone born of him. <laughs> you really can't stand these children of his, but you love him. And again, he says you can't do that. If you love the father who begets them, then you must love everyone begotten of them. And that really gets to the heart of this problem. It's everyone who believes is his child. Everyone who believes is his child. Who do you have to love as a believer? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, you are required to love them as your own sibling. Our love comes from effort, but it's a rich love because it also goes to everyone. It may look different in different scenarios, but it is love in every case and has to be. It is a very cheap love that only loves the lovable. If you love those who love you, Jesus said, what benefits that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners, unbelievers, they do the same. You're not different. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, I will invest in this relationship to get out of it. What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But, Jesus says, love your enemies. And in our passage, he's not even going that far. What is God requiring of you? Just to love your friends, <laughs> which can be just as hard. To love brothers and sisters. But it's not selectively just a few that have been born of God, but it's everyone who has been born of God. If you're a believer, you will love whoever has been born of God for his sake, because he's their father. According to tradition, John, who wrote this letter, had a disciple whom he taught named Polycarp, who became a martyr. But before Polycarp was martyred, he received a letter from another pastor of the early church named Ignatius, who it seems to us was also martyred. And even then, 2,000, 1,900 years ago, early church, even then Ignatius found it necessary to write to Polycarp, his fellow pastor, these words, if you love good disciples, he's talking about church members, if you love good disciples, it's no credit to you. Rather, with gentleness, bring the more troublesome ones into submission. Another martyr, much more recently, the German Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way, Christ calls us to love our neighbor 
Who's our neighbor? Quote, neighborliness is not a quality in other people. It is simply their claim on ourselves. You are required not to look at other people, find something you like in them, and then make the choice to love them. That's selective. Rich Christian love does not do that. You are required to look at someone else, say, is that a believer? And pre-commit yourself to loving that person, whatever is required, to loving that person. And you may start loving that person, and they start to get on your nerves. What do you do? Run! No, don't run. You have pre-committed yourself. It's one of the benefits of church membership. I know there's not a chapter verse for church membership, but it is your pre-commitment into a local group of believers. And you know when you pre-commit into loving believers, there's going to be some that you're not going to get along with naturally. But what did you think you were signing up for? (laughs) Is this a social club? What is this? This is His commandment that you love Every child born of him for his sake because he's the father. If you love the father, then for his sake you love his children. Not for their sakes. Not for our sakes. You're doing it for the father. But rich Christian love is not selective in who it chooses to love, even sacrificially. But instead, sows broadly in its love to anyone who has been born of God. Now... There are complex scenarios. An extreme would be abuse. How do you interact with someone who has abused you? There are ways to do that where you don't enable, you don't cause further harm. So love does not mean, you may just have one picture of what love means in your mind, not necessarily. Jesus spoke hard words when necessary. Paul rebuked Peter so hard. There's a tough love as well, but it has to be love. How can you be sure if you are really going to put in the effort to love everyone around you, you may not know, how do I even do that? Be at peace. There's verse 2. Not only do we love from our effort, not only do we love to every believer, toward every believer, but the love we give is guided by God's commandments. Look at verse 2 here. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments. And you might have to go home and read that 5, 10, 15 times. (laughs) So that can be a tricky verse there. Next week we're going to consider more closely the keeping of God's commandments, which He just introduced right there. Sort of out of the blue for us, but He does that when He's preparing to talk more about it. But just looking at this verse, you may notice that it is backwards. You probably expected John to say, if we, by this we know that we love God, if we love His children and keep His commandments. That'd be pretty easy. Notice that that's not what he does say. He reverses it. He says, do you want to know how you know you love the children of God? If you love God and keep His commandments. That is reversed, and I think it is reversed to draw an emphasis on the fact that there is a very close connection. They're almost inseparable between loving God, loving others, and keeping God's commandments. You can't separate those out. So you can even reverse them like he does here because they all go together. If you do one, you do the other and the other, no matter which direction it is. You may think that an outward life of love doesn't need rules. We're free of rules. We just want to love. You can't think that way. I think rules burden us down, slow us down. No, next week, verse 3, he's going to say God's commandments are not burdensome. Don't think like that. God's rules are something that we love as believers. They don't justify us. You don't get right with God by keeping God's commandments anywhere in Scripture. It is by faith in Christ. But once you believe, your heart changes toward God and His law, His words, so that you can read Psalm 119 and with the psalmist say, Oh, how I love your law. I love the commandments of God, not because by keeping them I become righteous, but because being, having been reckoned righteous in Christ, now they guide me. 
It is one of their functions to guide believers. This is so important because we live in a day when talking about love, love can mean just about anything for almost anybody you talk to. You may do something the Bible defines as loving and everyone thinks it's unloving and vice versa. How are you going to know how to really genuinely love other people? Like I said, complex situations arise even within the church. Maybe someone is taking advantage of you, requesting money, wasting it, requesting more money, wasting it, requesting more money. But they're saying, if you love me, you'll give it to me. See, you have to love me. <laughs> you need to love others in a way that is guided by the scriptures. The principles of Scripture will help you not to enable the person while you continue genuinely to love them, to do what is best for the person. You may witness someone who has a sin habit that is hurting their witness toward others. And you may feel, because it's the cultural climate, that the most loving thing is just to leave them right there because if you say anything about it, not only is it awkward, but it seems unkind. And yet Scripture commands that you have to rebuke others. When they sin, believers, and it's not unloving to do it. A rich love is guided by the commandments of God, and we'll see more of that as we continue on in 1 John. But it's not just a blind love, it's guided by God's word. So brothers and sisters, as we come to the end of this, John puts it simply, so I will put it simply too. Do you love God? Then, whatever it requires of you, love every other person in this room and beyond these walls who are believers, to the best of your knowledge, and even unbelievers and enemies, but especially here, believers. You have to see this as not an optional matter. You are not allowed to leave on a Sunday morning, go home, and not love believers for the rest of the week, and come back and hear the word, and say you love God, and sing the songs. You're not allowed to do that. If you do it, John says, you're lying. You have to leave here, and by God's grace, knowing His love for you, live an outward, centrifugal life, characteristically, day by day. Before you knew Christ, it was centripetal. You were sitting at your tax booth, and at that point, if you wanted life to be all about you, you could have done it. You were sitting out there mending your nets by Lake Gennesaret, and if at that point you wanted your life to just be you in your house by yourself, none of the complications of relationships, you could have done it. But if you love God, if you have gotten up to follow the man on the shore who said, follow me, then you will look around and there will be 11 other disciples. You have committed yourself to an outward life in love toward believers. It's not an option for you anymore. You have to do what an outward person does. Love your brother and your sister. You have to do it more than you did yesterday. You get to do it more than you did yesterday because this is the commandment we have from him. That whoever loves God should also love his brother and his sister.